Diane, thank you for joining me. I, I was looking forward to talking to you uh, w about this today. Um, I've always really enjoyed your perspective on on the arts and on, on, on our business and, and life in general. And I've heard you speak many times and really enjoyed it every time. So thank you for, for uh, making time for this discussion about life in general, our lives in this time of COVID. Um, and uh, as, as we get started, uh, I realize not everybody potentially knows who you are. So would you just say who you are, what you're doing now, and, and, uh, and how you got to where you are, a bit of your journey? Of course. And first, let me say it's just a real privilege and sincere pleasure to be in conversation with you today. So thank you so much for that. Um, I actually began my career in the arts as a theater maker. I have an MFA in acting and directing and in my 20s um, worked in the theater and then in my 30s moved into I guess presenting and working in festivals. I helped to turn around a small rural music festival and then bounced around a bunch of different music festivals and film festivals um, working in a variety of different positions but along the way really expanding my aesthetic uh, and getting experience with various aspects of producing and presenting and then had the opportunity to work with the Contemporary Performing Arts Center on the boards in Seattle, Washington as their managing director, leading them also through a challenging time and through a kind of turnaround. And then I moved to New York uh, and worked at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which is the largest sustained private funder of the arts and humanities in the United States. And I was a program officer there for theater and dance, a job I love greatly. Uh, all of my jobs, which, actually, way, I have to say. Which, by the way, is when we met, when you That's were there. right. That's exactly right. And um, so from Mellon, I actually jumped the pond and moved to the Netherlands to marry uh, a Dutchman that I had been dating long distance and to go back to graduate school. Uh, I, I sort of made the shift to academia, started teaching, started uh, going to grad school, and began my blog, Jumper, which some people may know me uh, by, and began more and more giving talks, writing essays, writing articles, that sort of thing, and really have been pretty firmly uh, based in academia ever since, always with a foot out in the real world. Um, these days, I am at the New School in New York City in the East Village. Uh, I came there three years ago to help launch and build a new Masters of Arts Management and Entrepreneurship program for artists working in the performing arts. And I am also the director of the Cultural Leadership Program at the BAMP Center for Arts and Creativity in Canada. And on the side, I do a bit of, you know, consulting here and there, though I've never really hung my shingle out for that a bit of writing here and there. I'm still trying to get my dissertation done for my doctorate. Um, and uh, occasionally I teach at Yale as well, a workshop on aesthetic values in a changed cultural context. So that's the kind of scope of me at the moment and, and historically. Well, and it's that scope of you that I'm so delighted that we have with us here to hear those perspectives because you do come at this from so many interesting points of view. Um, so the first question just, you know, about this COVID moment is, uh, it's obviously impacted everybody and some of it is obvious, but how has it impacted your work and what sort of impact do you see in your immediate universe around you? Yeah, thanks. I, well, most obviously, I think everyone working in the arts has been keenly aware of how this has disrupted uh, the livelihoods of many cultural workers and most notably artists in particular, which is a constituency that I deal with quite a bit. So at the New School, my program is for pre-professional and professional artists who want to gain additionally enterprise skills. And overnight, they lost their gigs and they also lost many of them their day jobs and uh, or other jobs that they do on the side of their gigs. 
And so it was pretty devastating to them. And of course, we've read a lot about this ever since. But I would say the larger shift in work has been this shift to online, which was made at the new school in a matter of days. Um, we went from having one course in the entire College of Performing Arts that was online, which was a course in my program, to putting nearly the entire course catalog online. And th this is either, these are conservatories, right? So these are um, not courses that one traditionally thinks of, of uh, taking remotely. And I would say it's been less about the technology and really about understanding how this shift to something that's often referred to as a flipped classroom really disrupts power relations and teaching dynamics um, and how we as teachers really can put ourselves in service of students who may be better off having more agency over their learning journey, right? So in both at the new school and at the BAMP Center, where we have participants also going through a year-long program, I've been so impressed with how the students or participants themselves have stepped up to say, right, this is what I need. This is where I, what I want to learn next. This is where I need to go. And feeling um, what it means to step back, to to look at really trying to understand what the student needs at that moment in time and to try to support that journey, as opposed to just marching through a kind of preordained syllabus of you know, topics and articles and things like that. And so that's been actually really pretty revelatory. And, and it's great to, to, to realize now that this is among the tools that we have in our toolkit for teaching, right? Is that we do know that we can go online um, others, of course, have done this long before us, and that good things can come of this. It's also made me appreciate the great things that can happen when you're in a classroom with someone. There's certainly an energy that you can get in the dynamics between students and between the student and the prof, but also um, I think there's an emotional intimacy, in a sense, that can happen in the classroom, or there's a way in which people can connect to one another. Cohort building, trust building, and things like that, I think, happen much more easily in that setting. Well, uh, you're, you're reminding me of um, the essence of our work, in addition to bringing people together to gather around a shared experience is about what artists uh, produce, present, give us, share, where they take us, where they challenge us, where they enrich our lives, uh, where they explain things that you can't explain any other way, make sense of moments like this. And so in our work at the Arsht, we've created a few avenues for artists in Miami to still be engaged. And we are you know, trying to make a small difference uh, as much we can by keeping some teaching artists employed and, and other artists, uh, giving them paid opportunities to populate our online world, which is Arst at Home. Um, and, and they're making huge contributions and just enriching our lives in ways that only artists can. And I'm delighted we can do it, but we're not doing nearly enough. How do, how do you think during this time, artists and the arts uh, can, what can and should they do during this time? Mm, thank you. That's a great question. And I also, I want to commend you on what you are doing at Arsht at Home. I checked out the resources when you first sent me the link a few weeks ago, and you, I know you've continued to add to it. And I'm really impressed with the sorts of new programming that you are uh, putting online and the, the various ways that you're trying to reach um, communities that you serve. It's terrific. You know, I, I mean, in some ways, so my conception of the role of art and society is that uh, comes from Bill Sharp, who says that art is the way we share with one another what it means to be human. Mm. And I also like very much this notion that cultural institutions um, are among the institutions that have the capacity to bring people together across divides on equal terms. Mm. And I think both of those things are things that can happen in any kind of space, including a virtual space. 
at this moment in time, it feels to me that our communities are in need of a range of things, ways of dealing with loss, with their grief, which we're only beginning to, to come to terms with, uh, sense-making of all of this. Um, we need to lift our, find ways to lift our spirits, to find hope. Um, sometimes we need distraction from the stresses of COVID-19. I also think that we need help imagining the excuse me, future beyond COVID-19 and how we want to create, uh, recreate, rebuild our communities, perhaps in a way that's healthier and more equitable and more sustainable. And I believe um, artists and cultural institutions um, can play a key role in serving their communities um, in these ways. I also think I, just over the weekend, an artist friend of mine, a visual artist named Greg Conniff, um, turned me on to a book um, at the center of all beauty by Fenton Johnson. And it's essentially about the beauty in solitude. And I think there's something that artists in particular have to teach us about that. So the, there's much about the human condition that is challenged at the moment. And artists and cultural institutions, I think, have something to offer there. And the mode of doing that, well, I think we're already seeing a thousand experiments in this, right? Everyone's already doing it. You're doing it. You just have to go to any website of a cultural institution and you see the many ways we're trying to get at this. And all we can do is keep experimenting and asking ourselves, what do we notice? What do we notice? You know, which of these kind of takes hold and people say, we love this, please give us more. And which of these, not really, and we have to keep trying again or asking questions, but it's the inquiry around that. And I think understanding these essential ways that we can help each other share with one another what it means to be alive at this moment in time and to have hope for the future. Well, that last sentence, what it means to be alive and hope for the future, sort of captures uh, so much of what artists uh, give us, right? Uh, mm -hmm work that they have done through centuries uh, and uh, I, I guess the one unfortunate truth is that artists certainly uh, of all kinds of um, professions understand hardship it, this is not the first time that they would have been challenged and existentially challenged and somehow there's that innate ability to draw deep deeper than most of us mere mortals uh, and and find sense or find a way to articulate that which is so necessary for the human condition. So um, as, this, as this unfolds, people are losing their jobs, they're losing uh, so many really, really uh, practical and substantial things in their lives. And, and so how could we talk to folks like that who are in that position about the arts and why is that important? Why, why should the arts be on their radar during this time? Yeah, you know, I think there's a, I think there's a fine line between, you know, making, trying to make the case for the importance of the arts at a time when people are struggling with really essential things in a kind of rational way that doesn't feel right, right? It's like, I don't, I don't know that a sort of here's our best argument for the arts versus something else that you might want to spend your time on or spend your dollars supporting or something like that. But I do think that one of the things that can happen right now is that we can just be there for people in a number of ways. And we're already seeing that. We're seeing the power of anything from celebrities who are from their homes, reaching out to people and uplifting spirits to, you mentioned teaching artists. I'm amazed at the ways that, you know, teaching artists and artists of all kinds have put themselves in service of helping parents who are at home trying to find ways to keep their children entertained while learning. Um, these are all, I think, 
ways of helping people feel in a really visceral way, in an essential way, how and why the arts are really important. And maybe the time to come for asking for support from the community at large, at least, is going to come later. I mean, of course, you know, our closest you know, donors and subscribers and loyal fans are, are likely wanting to know how they can support us, but particularly, I think, individual artists who are struggling and, and smaller institutions who may be at risk of collapse, et cetera. Um, but I also think this is a good time for us to ask ourselves, you know, what is it that really needs to be sustained over time? And is it the existing infrastructure, nonprofit, arts and culture infrastructure of particular sizes and types of institutions scattered in certain uh, geographic areas serving certain demographic populations? Is it, you know, um, a diverse pool of artists and uh, art forms and uh, uh, um, ways of, of of making and doing and knowing the world through art that we want us to sustain? Is it, you know, an expressive life for all? Is that what we want to sustain? I think now is also the time to ask ourselves, you know, what, what is it that we want to make sure um, we still have and what might we need to let go of as we move forward into the future? Big questions, and you're right. This moment uh, might catalyze um, and accelerate those those moments uh, and, and totally. decisions. I, I agree. Uh, um, I also can't help imagining what this moment would have been like without the arts, without the ability to listen to a piece of music or listen to a blog or look at anything online. Uh, I think everybody is is participating in that probably more than ever yeah, without a doubt yeah sorry i didn't mean to cut you off yeah the i think the um that's what i mean by maybe now is not the time to try to make the rational case now is just the time to say how can we how can we be of service how can we support how can we be out there reaching people with the hope that when all is said and done they look back and go i never would have made it through the last six months 18 months 36 months however long we're going to be in this state um, without the beauty and the inspiration and the laughter and the, the various things that um, art will have given us. Yeah. So we will get through this, right? Uh, let's agree on that, please. Yeah. <laughs> we will get through this and, and, and then we're going to emerge. And I love your perspective of people will think back on the role that art and artists played during this dark time, in this time of darkness, there is this light at least. Um, but on the other side of it, when we come out, what, what might our role be then? Now we're gonna face a community that will be a different kind of community. People will have different needs. Uh, mm -hmm. Our social contracts will have changed. Um, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on, on that moment. You know, part of what I, I think this is both a, a this is a hope more than maybe a um, prediction because of course it is so hard to predict what will happen. But if anything, I would love to see the arts come back as a more essential part of the social fabric, less sort of you know icing on the cake, and more part of the cake. Um, mixed in with all of the other sectors, right? Knitted together with health and transportation and health and human services and, you know, all of the, um, you know, food, food um, uh, security and all of the ways that we would define kind of quality of life, education, et cetera. Um, at the at the new school, alongside the arts management and entrepreneurship program, I've recently worked to design and launch a new graduate minor in what we're calling creative community development, which is about the role of artists in equitable community development and change. And, um, 
it's really, you know, this area of creative placemaking is really what we're talking about with that graduate minor. And so much of what it feels like we're being called to do and why that graduate minor, for instance, was so interesting to me is what does it look like if we don't see ourselves as separate from all of these, but really think about what it means to work alongside and in support of these other sectors and work together to make communities that are, as I think I said earlier, healthier, more equitable, more sustainable, right? So I think there's a, if, if there's a calling that I see for the arts, it's to kind of move into that space and to not, um, in a sense, allow ourselves to revert back to a kind of, you know, we're, you know, we're the place you come for a little diversion on the side of the rest of life. Uh, we, we have economic impact on our communities. Um, we, we're, we're basically put on great shows for you. You know, that I think that's a, a limiting notion for what we can be. And this is really the opportunity for us to move boldly into that other space. Um, I don't know if you may have picked up on our website, but uh, we just recently developed a five-year strategy. And the theme of the name of the strategy is Arst Connect, uh, because we felt if there's one thing we have to do better or more of and more deeply is to connect with community uh, where they are and be much more meaningful in their lives as a, as a part of their life, as a part of, as you call it, the quality of life that they lead and not this sort of optional extra uh, or some. So um, I, I, uh, I, I deeply share the hope that you have of what it would be on the other side of this. Uh, we, we at the Arts are beginning to think about what this transition, this hybrid moment would look mm -hmm. like. Uh, and, and you know, some of what we used to do, we will do again. I don't think, you know, Everything will be thrown out, but I totally agree to revert back 100% would not be a, a step forward. That would be wasting this opportunity. So uh, I, I love that that hope. Um, so artists, let's get back to them. I, mm -hmm. I, I think that's really at the, at the heart of this, of course, is what would you say to them now? Uh, I want to study art, I want to perform, I want to be especially a live performing art. I can't imagine being a dancer right now mm -hmm. and, and truly losing your voice. Um, what would you say to artists now as a sort of a parting thought? Well, I mean, I think, I also want to back up, I think a little bit to the question you asked before and maybe then move into this, which is, um, maybe thinking separately about or, you know, cultural institutions versus artists, right? And, and, and the possibilities moving forward. We can anticipate, right, already that behaviors are gonna change, habits are going to change. They're already changing in people. And people may also have less money to spend on the arts. Um, those who have venues, I think, are going to be in this particular position of having to think beyond the venue um, and imagine um, various ways of reaching into communities. And I think it's possible if people are only comfortable in their homes or gathering with people that they know in a small geographic area, that part of what will be a value will be literally artists traveling into your neighborhood you know, with a talk, with a piece, with a, a day of, of working with you and your neighbors to make something, et cetera. Um, I think on the flip side, as we get more comfortable with gathering, maybe what we want are events where artists help us design really massive community events that bring everyone out together on the streets, in the fairgrounds, in a stadia to see each other and celebrate and have major experiences together, right? So, and maybe in this, 
we need to decouple in a sense venues from work from mission right so that we have the flexibility to imagine beyond these walls um, and yeah as we think about spaces we may need to think about what does it mean to take out all the seats just so that we all have a lot more flexibility in what we can do in these spaces and things like that and i think along the way artists should be part of these conversations and these imaginings one of the things that troubles me a bit is when I see, you know, artists because they are not often on year round salary contracts and institutions are kind of let go. Not only is it a financial hardship for them, etc. But also, if I were running a cultural institution right now, to my mind, artists, teaching artists, all kinds of artists would be among those I would want sitting alongside me and the rest and with community members imagining and thinking about this future. And so one message I would have to artists is um, to, to get yourself at these tables and be, and not be, and, and if nobody's inviting you to tables, then build collectives and uh, build your own tables and start imagining the future and imagining what you think uh, will be needed and creating that. Um, experiment and share with one another your experiments and also you know we may have a time where artists need to gather with other workers and fight for better contracts and fight for better security in some ways and make sure that the next time we have um, something like COVID-19 that we don't see the large majority of our artist populations in really impoverished um, circumstances struggling to keep going um, despite everything. Um, so I think maybe a parting thought is, yeah, keep experimenting and keep noticing and, and know that you are essential and that there are many, many individuals out there, I think, within cultural institutions and at large who recognize this as well and um, who, who know very well that going forward, we need artists to help us move into the future. And if there's anything that gives me hope right now, it's that we have artists to help us get there. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that you, you ended on that note and that we um, at the Arts uh, um, are, are also always aware of without artists, we are just a building. Uh, and that's not our mission is to be a building. Um, and so uh, you've challenged me again, as you usually do, uh, to be better at what we do as we create the future is to, uh, you know, invite people to the table. Um, uh, we 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 keep doing it, but we need to do more of it, and uh, and to encourage artists to build their own tables if they're not invited. I I, I like that. I think that's really really good. Um, Diane, as always, I I just uh, enjoy talking to you, and uh, want to thank you for spending some time with me and and sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, I think that's great. Uh, our 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 folks are going to enjoy listening to you. Johan, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure and I really appreciated your questions, but also I'm so admiring of the specific work you're doing at the Arsh and um, keep going. And I know this must be an incredibly challenging time uh, for all uh, leaders of cultural institutions making really tough decisions right now and trying to navigate uh, with limited resources and uh, all sorts of challenges and I just wish you all the best and everyone who's watching as well. Um, uh, I believe in the power of networks to um, get us through this. Um, thank you for hosting these conversations. I'm sure they're providing a lot of comfort to your community as well. Thank you, Diane. Uh, take care. Be Thanks. safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>